Welcome back everyone to What Is This Weapon? I'm Jonathan and this is the Ingram Model 10, technically. There's no getting away from the fact that people will always call it the Mac 10. It just sounds cool. Uh, also the Mac 11, baby brother to this. We're not, we're not focusing on that today. Quite a lot to cover actually, just from the M10. Now, what you saw me shooting in our opening there was the classic uh, American made, Gordon Ingram designed, uh, Mac 10, uh, albeit in 9mm, 9x19, not in the more, perhaps more iconically associated with the M10 45 ACP. Um, but nonetheless, um, now that's partly because this is an ex British military example. You can actually see it, I'll briefly show you that. So the overall black paint finish is quite redolent of uh, British military service. Um, double serial numbering as well, so just like with the AR-15s, if you've seen those videos we've done, you get double serial numbers, because they always want to keep the upper and the lower together. Um, now, from what I've seen, they weren't necessarily always using the front grip strap, but it is on there. And it's very important, actually, for safe use of the uh, MAC-10, as you probably gathered from the shooting video. And the other British aspect to this... Uh, it's completely American. American made. It was an American contract in 1973 to supply uh, UKSF, Special Forces, Special Operations Forces, with Ingram submachine guns. The other British feature are, is British military proof, which is on the barrel, the bolt, and the receiver there, the crossed pennants. So if you ever come across one of these anywhere with those features, you know it's a British military service Ingram. Now I say military, as I say, it's actually only UK Special Operations Forces that had these things. Uh, may maybe as much as many as 100 in total, we're not entirely sure. Do check out, in fact we will show you an amazing video from 1983 um, of some mustachio gentlemen in flared uh, jeans. And among other things, these guys are SBS, they're, they're reenacting a uh, raid on a, an oil rig. And one of the, well, one of the main weapons used is Model 10, because that's the kind of the heyday in British service. 175, yes. 719, yes. The SBS have studied and rehearsed their special role in this type of operation. And their immediate priority is to draw weapons, pre-packed ammunition, and all the equipment necessary for their role in the operation. Regular Army, other British military forces did not use the, the Ingram. It was just UKSF, and really for a narrow window of time as well. 1973 to, well, they're, they're obsolete um, in 1991. So, and I think they're pretty much out of use well before that. As Soon as the MP5K comes in um, with SAS and SBS, this thing is old news. It's not ideal um, in a number of ways. It's heavy. It's kind of inherently inaccurate, even if you're not a museum curator trying to shoot it. Um, yeah, the, the, the ergonomics are not necessarily even to 1980s standards. So they moved away from it, but that's not really the British story that we're here to feature. I did want to, to cover that because it's, yeah, people, some people know that this was UKSF as well. So we'll replace this with this. This is the star of this particular video because this is the British variant of the Ingram M10. So Ingram introduces or finishes his, his design in I think 1964. This we're looking at the uh, early 1980s and we have three companies making this particular variant. So it starts out with Creative Gunsmithing Limited, um, which was a, a UK company based in the south. And they redesign the Mac 10. Now, if you've got the um, the big the big boys book of the Ingram um, called the Mac Man by um, Frankie Yanomiko, recommend it. Then you'll see that the variations on the Ingram series are just almost limitless. <laughs> but there's one unique feature, as far as I can tell, of this homegrown British M10, and it's this grip here. Now, it's not unique in the sense that some of you may recognize this. This is specifically the late 80s era um, micro Uzi pistol grip. Uzi, why did he say Uzi? Well, because this is one of a number of M10 variants where the magazine housing, in fact, if I flip it around, you immediately get the idea. There's an Uzi magazine catch. 
and it's just the gun redesigned to take an Uzi magazine. Different pattern to, to what you just saw. Same caliber, 9x19. So there are plenty of Mac 10s in this basic arrangement with this pattern of pistol grip and magazine well. What they don't have, other than this British version, is this form of um, IWI designed micro Uzi pistol grip. Nobody else seems to have gone with this. If anyone knows of a variant in the US or elsewhere that does have this, let me know because it will make it harder to tell these apart. Other different features, well, the originals are marked CG Firearms Limited M10 9mm. We don't have any so marked. Um, then we have there's Mitch, Mitchell Arms also making these. So this is again late, um, late 80s to early 90s. I would say 1990 is when the these guys are, are sort of, well, Creative Gunsmithing come, seems to originate the design and then uh, Mitchell Arms and the third company, I haven't mentioned yet, this one is Mark II. They sort of copy, they copy each other's homework as it were, I believe with Creative Gunsmithing's help to copy the design. Um, there's one other feature that's common to all three of these that I've just mentioned and that is the later Ingram style of disassembly. So the early, has a notch here with a plunger or, or a, a sprung disassembly catch and a cross, a single piece cross pin that you just push out and the upper and lower come apart. The, we'll leave that there. This British version, not uniquely, because there are the later Ingrams did this and other copies of it did as well. They omit the machining needed for this, the catch, the spring, and they go for a two-piece takedown pin of various patterns. And the SF and Mitchell and CG version, I can just actually show you this, is just a screw screwed into a pin. So it's a two, one of the various two-piece designs. But we're getting into the weeds here on the technical side. Um, there we go. So that third company I mentioned is proudly displayed on the side of a lot of these guns. If you see one with this micro Uzi grip on it, uh, and certainly with this design of stock on it, you are likely to see SF Firearms Tunbridge Wells. Now that might make some of our British viewers chuckle a bit, um, disgusted of Tunbridge Wells. Google it if you, if you don't know about that one. It's a bit, it's a bit of an old meme. Um, <laughs> Pre-meme meme, in fact. Nonetheless, it's not perhaps the sort of place you'd expect fully automatic, American-designed weaponry to originate. I think that's why it's a bit incongruous and a bit bit funny to me. Uh, but not funny to them, they were trading in these things. And, well, certainly SF, and I believe Mitchell, and possibly CG as well, these were available in all different flavours. So you had live fire, select fire, like the, the, the sort of real thing, if you like. You had semi-auto, so this is actually a semi. It has the sliding safety of the, the M10, but it does not have the AR-15 style selector for full and semi on the side. It is semi only, but closed bolt. And the stock option is kind of, I think, agnostic to which, which type it is. It doesn't matter if it's uh, semi or full auto or the third type, which was blank firing. Quite a big market for blank firing firearms, even before um, the um, the bans, the restrictions that came in in the UK. And there's relevance there <laughs> to, to something I'll come to in a moment. But I should also mention the, the buttstock. So we have this welded on trunnion type affair here for a different type of buttstock. It's not cut for the sliding buttstock you saw me operating on the standard Ingram, albeit stock variants did crop up elsewhere as well. But the, the British M10 was redesigned to accept, I don't know if anyone recognised this, this is the Australian leader rifle stock. I guess they had some lying around or they like the look of them or both. Quite unusual to see an Ingram with a fixed stock. Um, well, for us anyway. And this, so this bracket, I called it a trunnion, it's more of a bracket really here. Uh, once you fit that and you don't cut the grooves, well you can't and, and you don't put the, the spring catch for the butt, uh, standard butt, then you can't do the standard butt. So you're locked into either this or something that Mitchell Arms seem to have come up with, 
which is a different form of pivoting, two-piece pivoting, folding buttstock. In all other respects, these are standard. Um, yeah, there are, there are build standard differences on the internal parts uh, that we won't go into. Now, interestingly, before all this kicked off, in, or just before, in 1987, Gordon Ingram himself had approached the West Midlands Arms Company to license make the Ingram. Um, so I don't know if there's any direct connection there between these the three companies I've mentioned and the failed attempt by Ingram to do a licensed version. Um, but as, as far as I know, there's no licensing arrangement uh, for these other three companies. So there is some degree of success. I don't know how many were sold by the, by the three different makers, um, but they're all wrapped up by 1996 when the, the ban on semi-auto compact short firearms is, is definitely coming in. Um, companies are changing their, their stock, their, their approach. Um, some are deactivating on, on mass in order to sell the DX, as we, as we tend to call them or they were, uh, well, essentially they had to get rid of their stock one way or another. Uh, they could get a, um, some money by, ha by handing them into the police. That was the other, the other way of doing it. And out of that uh, is spawned, are uh, spawned two different criminal, significant criminal uses of these particular variants. The first, is in 1997, and this is associated with a metropolitan police operation called Operation Abenar. There's an excellent book by Michael Hallows um, that I recommend you check out that documents the whole story of that operation and how it's detected, who was involved, what the, what the results were. But that was um, reactivation of deactivated firearms. So there were 95 of these things um, that had been, uh, SF firearms in particular, that had been acquired uh, deactivated and then illicitly reactivated and sold to criminals with a particular type of ammunition, um, often with a suppressor. And they have a distinct uh, look to them. But this is an Abenar Mac 10, same basic design. It does have the proper threaded barrel on there, although there are official Ingram barrels that aren't threaded, just to complicate matters. And then the big giveaway here so we've got the SF firearms marking, this breech block here, this, this or bolt if you prefer. A lot of them are this bright, shiny, unfinished finish because they were being machined up in a in an illicit factory. But the key feature is actually this, what looks like this a strip here or groove. That's the extractor groove. It's been relocated and made simpler to, to manufacture, essentially. That's why it's up here. So if you spot that there. Now again, I haven't seen any other Ingram variants that have that. If anyone has, let us know. As far as we know, this first criminal armorer was the designer of this bolt. So that's uh, deactivated, uh, sorry, reactivated DAC. Serial numbers removed with weld or wet with welding tool. And deactivation marks also removed with the same welding tool. So this became a sort of forensic footprint for this type of weapon. Um, lots were recovered, um, lots weren't. Um, most of them have, I believe, now been recovered. We then have, you might have seen, you might have seen either of these types in, in the news if you follow this kind of um, criminal activity on, in the news or whatever. This is what's known as the Octane, Operation Octane um, MAC-10. So this is again involving Metropolitan Police, but primarily, or the initial in, uh, investigation, um, and the, where the name comes from is Thames Valley Police. Both of these incidents involved a lot of different forces, cross-border work, that kind of thing. So this 2007 incident, involved a um, similar number, 90 of these MAC-10s, but this time they were converted blank firers. And the excuse for purchasing all the blank firers to then illicitly convert was that they were for use in the James Bond movie Casino Royale. Um, I mean, for, <laughs> for all the person selling them was to know that might be true. Uh, suffice to say, I don't think there are any Ingrams in Casino Royale, but uh, I'm sure you'll tell us in the comments if there were. None of these made it to Casino Royale's uh, production, though they were converted and sold illicitly. And the key difference here is, well, we just have a solid looking bolt, because it's got the traditional, uh, well, <laughs> it's adapted from a blank firer. <laughs> so it has uh, a breech block that is of a particular design with an insert in it um, derived from the blank firing bolt, which I can show you as well. Lots of Mac 10s on the table. So we're looking here at this type of blank firer. And so some do have 
the two bolt holes and the visible insert of uh, this type of blank firer. Some have a less obvious bolt, but they don't have the groove is the point. So this is, um, this is unmarked, as are the Octane Mac-10s, as far as I know. And that's because these are um, converted blank firers or made from parts possibly as well, and they're sourced from that creative gunsmithing company, the original, the origin of all this, not from SF Firearms. So it gets a bit complex, but suffice to say, you end up with a whole series of sub-variants, and the two main criminal ones are these. The dead giveaway for, your, for this Operation Octane gun is this replacement barrel that looks a little bit less professional, shall we say. Um, it's more of a standard uh, criminal conversion type approach of just a great big chunk of steel with a bore in it. And unfortunately, uh, a number of murders and woundings and discharges uh, were committed with both of these types and incidents around the country. Uh, once they were in sort of circulation, they, they were available to, to the criminal element and they saw use. And they are still, unfortunately, I believe, showing up to this day, albeit the majority were recovered by these police services. Thanks for watching, guys. We do appreciate it. Um, as ever, we do have actual museums that you can come and visit. Um, check out our, our website, recently refreshed, and our social media outlets, um, the one that used to be called Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can actually play along, if you don't know already, with What's This Weapon by guessing what it is that we're going to be featuring the next week. Also, if you do visit our museums, check out, well, until the end of June at least, you can check out the exhibition Reloaded with a lot of decorated, cool and interesting firearms um, in there. And also, online, um, as well as our own channel, we are part of something called History of Weapons and War, which is an app that you can sign up to. Uh, you'll get our content ad-free, uh, same content on, from our side of things, but you also will get a load of, I think there are eight of us in total involved there, including Forgotten Weapons and various others that you'll definitely want to check out if you like the sort of thing we do here. But whatever you do, we'll see you again here next week.